Good morning. I bring you greetings. I'm from the University of Maryland. I've always loved their colors. University of Maryland School of Public Health in College Park, I bring you greetings from our Dean Boris Lusniak and one of your colleagues, Cynthia Bauer, who we recruited to the University of Maryland in College Park, okay? <laughs> so I think that, um, I don't know exactly why I was invited, but I may not get invited back. So I'm just gonna tell the truth here today because I think that's what we need to do. We're missing the truth telling. And in the context of the work that I do, where race is another factor that overlays the complexities of all the things we're talking about, I think it's important that we bring that into this room. Now, this image was developed uh, by a undergrad during the 50 year anniversary of the anniversary of the civil rights movement. And I keep using it because my undergrad class gets younger and younger. <laughs> my entering class was born in 2010. No, no, uh, 2000, okay? Don't fast forward, is my clock working? And so, there are times when I get stares as, as to who is this. We should not assume that the history is being taught. We should not assume that our international students get American history. We should not assume that the victories that we've made, the assumptions we make about our freedoms can be taken for granted. But there is one place where I think we can reconnect and it is in, in this space that we're in right now, this space of health. And so, this is my disclaimer. Things I say have nothing to do with the federal government that has funded our work over the past 20 plus years. And this is our team. I share this because we were at the University of Pittsburgh for 10 years, and, and when we left, our entire research team was recruited we're the largest cluster hire in the history of the University of Maryland to launch the Maryland Center for Health Equity. Institutional commitment matters. It cannot be lip service. And the people we serve are tired of being studied because they're still suffering. That's my message to all of us investigators in here. It's time to start taking action. So the social context matters. Dr. Bernie talked about social determinants of health. That's the key. Health literacy should not be talked about in moving forward without being talked about in the context of the social determinants of health. Do you know how many physicians and providers my parents interacted with when they were going through their illness and decline? Many of them were age 65 and over. And that, yet nobody in this room would ascribe some of these characteristics that we've seen on this screen to any of those physicians simply because they were 65 and over. Age must be contextualized. And so our aim here is, is to move beyond a biomedical model to really address the underlying drivers of these disparities, to address issues like breaking the cycle of poverty, to increase access to quality care, to eliminate environmental hazards in homes and neighborhoods, and importantly, to implement interventions that have been tailored to the very communities we're trying to reach. Now, I'm gonna take a risk here and take you into a community. And I just hope the technology works. So bear with me. You have hypertension, and I've been taking care of that for a long time. Hypered? Mm -hmm. Hypered? Like you're hyper? Mm -hmm. What does being hyper mean to you? That's, that's we'll back up okay. just a little bit. Let's I would um, give Tylenol, normally Motrin, because that's what my doctor recommended. How old is your daughter? She is four. She's four, okay. 
I would um, give her the um, four to five, a, ta a tablespoon and a half. I wanted to pause it there. I would give my daughter four to five tablespoons when it should be 1.5 teaspoons. One caps, one caps of that. That's right, one, one capsule. One caps of that. I don't know what this is. That's twice? Yeah, tw twice, twice daily. Okay. okay. So what? So how would you take this? When I see it, it's not on it, I tell you how to take it. It say take it twice daily, but it don't say what time to take it. Do you uh, know what hypertension means, if I asked you what that was? Because when I look at this, I think, well, maybe you have hypertension, and I've been taking care of that for a long time. Hypered? Mm -hmm. Hypered? Like you're hyper? Mm -hmm. What does being hyper mean to you? That's, that's uh, where you can't be still. You always got to be doing something. Do, you I, do you think I think you're hyper and have uh, hypertension? Yeah, I, I don't know. I, that's what I consider it. Okay. It being, you know. Okay. But you know you have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, but hypertension doesn't mean the same to you. Mm -hmm. So if I ask you if you have hypertension, you're going to just think I think you're jumping around on a chair or something like that, something different. Just being hyper, you know. Okay. All right. Well, I haven't done a very good job teaching you what hypertension is. Cause I, I want to just stop right there. A doctor who admitted... A mistake. Does it matter that it was a woman? Maybe. So, my, so if you can get me back to the slide deck. So it is a, you know, we're looking 20 years ago. This was produced by the American Medical Association. Guess what? It's still happening today. We should be ashamed. We should be sad that so much of the research that has been accumulated has not been implemented. And I want to know why. And I'm saying that because, Bernie, I think I'm around powerful people, OK? <laughs> I want to know why. And I want to see some anger in this room that it hasn't been done. And before, like I said, we, we go to cognitive decline, because as soon as I walk in the room and see my age, I guess I'm on the cognitive decline scale, we better look at empathy decline. If there's something wrong in our system when we have lost the caring part of caregiving. And we're going to be more likely to fix that than any of these neurological problems we're talking about. So let's see if we can agree on a definition. We talk about health disparity. It is not simply a difference in incidence, prevalence. A health disparity, according to Healthy People 2020, assuming they haven't gone and changed the websites, A health disparity is a particular type of difference that is closely linked to social, economic, and environmental disadvantage. Dr. Bernie was on target. It is a difference caused by something, systematic discrimination, lack of access, not because they want it, lack of access because they've been redlined, lack of access because they live in racially segregated neighborhoods. That's what a health disparity is. And health equity is the highest attainment of health achievable in a society. And it is unfortunate that that highest attainable level achievable in the United States is not the best in the world. We should be ashamed about that, too. So history matters. And many of you in this room may not be aware that these issues of literacy and access to care were issues throughout the history of America, especially for black people. And it was Booker T. Washington recognizing that black people had to take charge of their own health. And from 1915 to 1951, he launched the National Negro Health Movement, which became, in the 1930s, the first federal office of Negro Health Works. In 1951, in the name of integration, less one happy ship, they decommissioned the Office of Negro Health Works. 
Fast forward to 1985, Margaret Heckler, Secretary Task Force Report, and once again, we created an Office of Minority Health with almost amnesia to all the success of the Negro Health Movement, where lots of people couldn't read. They were coming out of slavery, coming through Jim Crow, but it worked because of the creative imagination that they used to engage this population. This should be harvested for what we should be doing today. Bernie, I believe that underneath it all is the issue of trust. You raised the issue of the flu. I can't walk into a grocery store without getting offered a free flu stop. But why don't we have the uptake? Misinformation and lack of trust in our profession. That too we should be ashamed of. We have a solution that people are not uptaking because they don't trust it. In the black experience, these books represent the history of abuse in the name of science, of abuse in the name I'm here to help you. They remember these things. It's passed on by word of mouth. And a grandmother can have more credibility than a physician or a psychologist. The Tuskegee Sylphus study is another example of, again, what we can do when we want to. None of these men could read. Yet they kept them in a research study for 40 years. When you look at how they did that, they used very sophisticated plain language methods. Not to empower those men, but to get them to do what the researchers wanted them to do. It was never a secret. They learned the cues of the community, and they manipulated them to get what they wanted. Those same methods can be used for good. It is now part of the cultural memory in many black communities. And if the providers have no idea, they're missing a major part of that caring and communication. One of our products in our, from the National Bioethics Research Initiative is Building Trust. This is an online interactive website I encourage you uh, to visit. Boy, that clock's moving fast. And so let me go to what I suggest are some of the solutions. And here's what it looks like. Fourth generation disparities research. When we, over the course of this day, as you hear the different studies, you might be able to do this. First generation research documents the problem. Have we been documenting the problem of health literacy? Second generation disperse explains the reasons why. Well, we got cognitive decline on the table. We have poverty on the table. We have a number of reasons. You can do this and never leave your office. You just need a good data set. Third generation provides solutions. Dr. Wolf just sat here and told you the work they did at Geisinger that came up with solutions. When we get a chance to quiz, we'll find out how many hospital systems around the country have now implemented it as their standard of practice. I would suggest we will be surprised how few. So our science lives in our journals and is not being implemented. And so we call for a fourth generation of disparities research. You think about it as a fourth generation of health literacy research that's tied to social determinants, that recognizes the role that race plays and poverty. And we build off of the free previous generations to do what? To take action. And that's to restore our own credibility in the very communities that have lost trust in us. Here's what some of it looks like from the world that I work in. In, 19, in 2001, the federal government launched a campaign called Take a Loved One to the Doctor Day. Raise your hand if you've heard of it. It was a very expensive campaign. <laughs> Great materials, good website, but the, in the communities that we work, the people didn't have doctors. But we liked the idea. So we turned it on its head, and we called it, take a health professional to the people. And what we did was to take physicians, nurses, pharmacists, the whole array of us out of the hospital, and we put them in black barbershops and beauty salons. And in this scene right here, you see a pharmacist 
talking with a young man getting his hair cut who most likely will not see a doctor unless he walks into an emergency room. Now, Bernie, I have to tell you that no self-respecting black barber would ever say, I'll get you in and out in 15 minutes. <laughs> Steve Rush and I both would be in there for half a day <laughs> catching up on the sports, talking to people, getting caught up, and I saw the power of a barber to override a doctor's recommendation. A man came in that people hadn't seen for a while, and they said, where have you been? And he said, I was diagnosed with a heart attack that kept me in the hospital for three days. Everybody in the barbershop is listening. Football game's on, music's on, Judge Judy's on, but everybody's listening. And he says, the doctor told me I'm going to have to take these pills for the rest of my life. And the barber said, you know, if you take those pills, you won't be able to keep up your obligations. See, Bernie understands what I'm talking about. This is the cohort thing. For the rest of you, erectile dysfunction is a problem with some of the hypertension drugs. And I looked at that guy's face, Bernie. He's not taking those drugs. ER, three days, diagnose, prescription. He's not taking those meds. I said, what if that barber had said, hey, if you're having symptoms, tell your doctor they can adjust things. What if they were partners with us? And that's what we've done in this campaign called HAIR. Health Advocates in reach and research. And what we do is to really flip the switch. We bring the health professionals to the people in the settings that people trust, in communities that many of our health professionals just drive by on their way to work or bypass on a beltway to get around that dangerous community. We have put them on bicycles. You know what? They love this. It reminds them why they became a health professional in the first place. And this scene right here says what? This young black man with his leather coat on, and trust me, it was hot that day, but he is still cool. And this young Jewish physician wearing his yarmulke, white people have culture too. These two people would never meet were it not for this moment. We've got to create more moments like this. We have a book, chapter, describing the whole process. We have 10 shops throughout the metro DC area. We're funded by the Cigna Foundation. I love the fact that Merck's in the house. I want all of you to stop competing and cooperating on something bigger than your companies. We're taking this around the United States launching the National Association of Black Barbershops and Health so that we can bring our health professionals to a new place for engaging our most vulnerable citizens. In this scene here, you have one of our basic science researchers collecting DNA in the barbershop. Why, Bernie? Trust. Trust. Many of these guys have been in these shops for 30, 40 years. The physicians would love to have the relationship with their patients that these barbers and salon operators have. And we need to also take what we learn back to our institutions. This is President Wallace Lowe meeting his neighbors in the barbershop. In many of our institutions, our academic health science centers, you can draw a one or two mile radius around them and find some of the worst health statistics in the region. Unacceptable. And so for those who control the system, like my president, to meet those who have lost all hope in the system is the only way I believe we can come together as one community. I'm looking at, they started me just a little late I'm going to show you what happens when we take the providers into these spaces. These are internists 
who had their national meeting in Washington, D.C. They did a pre-conference workshop and signed up 35 of them to be dispersed throughout our barbershop network. Here we go, Alexis. The last technical hurdle. Can you bring the sound up? Hey, how are you doing? So we're here today at Kelvin's Barbershop. We have internists who are doing their residency, and they're here in the shop providing medical services. So our point of being here today is to take the health professionals to the community and also for them to understand why it's important to build a relationship with the community. And as one of the physicians asked me, he said, what can we do so that we could get more patients to come to see us? And I said, well, one of the things is build a relationship. Do things that you're in your home city by working with uh, barbers and stylists. I'm a first year resident at uh, Southampton Hospital. Um, in family medicine. I just happened to bring these today because I just found it so amazing. This It's basically a, measure, a way to measure stress level through um, temperature on your skin. Right now we're in social medicine month, which is very unique to our program, where this is part of our, you know, this is part of what we're doing for a month, kind of going around to different places in the community, getting to know our community, um, and you know, learning about aspects of medicine that we don't learn in med school. Well, it started when I was uh, in the military, retired in the military, I did 22 years. I knew this is what I wanted to do, because I love cutting hair, and just, you know, being, with, being involved with the community. I love people, I love dealing with people, and it's something I always wanted to do was have my own business. So in 2011, I started opening Cuts by Kevin Barbershop. I got involved with this hair um, project as an African-American man we tend not to go to the doctors as often. And I think the best place to target is a barbershop. It's kind of giving back also. And just having questions answered that you guys can answer here versus going to the doctor. And sometimes people feel that, okay, if I get my blood pressure checked in the barbershop, okay, at least that's something, like I did something. And what they probably need to go to the doctor, they don't want to hear that, oh, well, this is what's going on with you, sir. They don't want to hear that. As physicians, we sometimes just tend to stay in our offices and uh, wait for the patients to come to us. But you know, coming here to the barber shop, it's it's yeah. I mean, they they cut hair, but they really do a lot more than that. They are community centers where people come to hang out, especially on Saturdays and Sundays, and talk. So being here is not just being here as to get a haircut. You're really here to talk and socialize. Being a part of this program really helps to not equalize, but attempt to maybe balance out that inequality of healthcare availability when you're reaching out more people in different places, places that might not have the same concentration of physicians, it really helps to elevate the level of healthcare in the country. I'm out of time. The discussion questions, maybe we can pick it back up again. Thank you very much.